Welcome, welcome. We are excited today to have you on board. Today we're going to build an app and I see people from all around the world joining us. If you don't mind, as you're joining us, say hi and to say where in the world you're from. Uh, I'd love to see. I see people from California, from Florida, from, from South Africa, some, uh, some from uh, Asia, all over the place. So thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us today. So we, what are we going to do today? Well, we're going to build a series of applications. And my name is Brian Knight from Pragmatic Works, and I am here to uh, hopefully teach you today how to build these style of applications. Let me start with a few slides to introduce myself, and also I want to introduce uh, Ace, who's with me as well. Ace, in the background, say hi. Uh, she will be uh, working on uh, uh, some of the questions from you guys in the background. She'll also start your questions and uh, let me know when I should uh, uh, help you out as well. And then also uh, my team, I've got Marshall as well. Hey, Marshall. Uh, he's been working on the uh, a raffle that we're doing later today. Marshall's my marketing team, and he'll be working through uh, a lot of the, the logistics behind the scenes also. So let me get my, my one or two slides I have. Uh, we have a very, very hands-on day. My name is Brian Knight from Pragmatic Works. My email address is on the screen right there, as well as my Twitter handle or X handle, I guess. Uh, I'm a Power Apps MVP, which basically means I make a lot of content around the platform, uh, make a lot of YouTube videos, I've written a lot of uh, other things as well. I'm the founder of Pragmatic Works. We focus on uh, training around the Power Platform and the Azure Stack and other things like that. I've authored about 18 books when we used to have books. Uh, I've authored about 18 books. For those that know me, I sell those books outside the abandoned blockbuster on videos on weekends. I sell them next to the guy who sells the pit bull. In case you're curious, you'll find me there in your town here soon as well. And I blog at pragmaticworks.com. Or you can also find me on, uh, on YouTube as well and a number of other social ways. So what our agenda for today is, we're going to walk through building a number of applications. Uh, one of the applications we're going to do is building a time card system to where you can log uh, any kind of hours that you want to build to a project. Ace and I brainstormed for a while, and we, we, we do these things called hackathons at Pragmatic Works, where we teach people how to build with their own examples. And one of the common ones we've seen over and over again is some type of approval system, right? Where, where a request comes in, like a time card request, uh, somebody approves it, and then it's now approved, ready to go. So we're gonna build two applications today. We're gonna talk about these terms in a moment, but let me hop over to my slides and talk about what types of apps we're gonna build. Well, there's four types of apps we can build in Power Apps. Each of them have their own licensing consequences around it, and each of them have the reasons why you would use one over the other. Uh, by the way, we are going to do a break about an hour and a half into this also, right around 1230 East Coast time for about 10 minutes to let you stretch your legs. But this is a full course we're doing today. We're going to build two applications, a Dataverse set of tables. If we have time, we'll do a bonus application in Power Pages also just to show you how that same data can be provisioned and used all around your ecosystem. Now, to start with, though, there are a number of styles of apps we can choose in Power Apps. The first and most common one is a Power Page. Power, pa sorry, sorry, Power Apps, uh, Canvas application, excuse me. Canvas applications allow you to connect to almost 1,200 data sources, as of today at least, and they're adding more data sources all the time. They call it a Canvas application because it is a blank canvas. You can do whatever you want to on it. You can drag, drag and drop things two pixels to the left or right, and it looks that way on your application also. Anything you do works cross-platform on an iPhone, an Android, a Mac, or a PC, or even a Chromebook. Doesn't matter. There's a native application on your phone or tablet, or you can also use uh, the, the traditional web browser if you wanted to as well. The big markers of a Canvas application, though, they're prettier, generally. They are responsive from the first moment. And uh, it is also connects to 1,200 data sources. One of those data sources is Dataverse. And we'll talk about Dataverse in a moment. But essentially, in short, it is a database that is a, a SQL Server database behind the scenes. And it allows your business users to create tables and define security systems and create columns and store data. So it makes it where anybody that was a SharePoint person or anybody that's built an Excel spreadsheet can build a Dataverse table. The other app styles 
So Canvas app can connect to 1,200 data sources, including Dataverse. However, every other app I'm about to show you does require uh, Dataverse be somewhere in the puzzle. Model-driven apps are best used for a, a audience that's, that's a, a more technically proficient audience. So model-driven apps will be used for uh, the connected Dataverse and allow you to build out applications quickly. Matter of fact, our model-driven app, once we create our tables today, we'll be able to create those in less than 30 seconds or so. So super easy to build. So model-driven apps are much more about forms and list of data, and then a whole bunch of options around it. These can be a little more intimidating for a, uh, a user that's not used to a lot of high-end type stuff, like having too many buttons might intimidate them. If too many buttons intimidate your users, go Canvas. If your users are Excel users, then go model driven. It's a very, very awesome option for you. Okay, so next, there is Power Apps for Teams. This is a free, a, a freemium version of Power Apps. If you have a Teams license, you own this today. It allows you to install a two gig version of Dataverse inside of each team that you wish. That Dataverse table can have up to a million records inside of it. And it allows you to build these beautiful Canvas applications right from within Teams. Your users will use Teams to access the application, and your developers will use Teams to build the application. It is identical to a Canvas app largely. However, it's using Dataverse, and it's hosted in Teams. And the last app style is called Power Pages. It used to be called Power Apps Portal, so excuse the old slide here. Power Pages allows you to go out and connect to Dataverse and show this amazing data that you've built in Dataverse on a website instead. If you want to expose this application that you've built to an outside audience, maybe to contractors or to parents, if you're a university and you want to build a, a, a portal for your parents or your students, Power Pages is the way to go. It gives you like a, a CMS, a WordPress kind of feel but with showing Dataverse forms and Dataverse lists. So those three slides are our only slide we're going to show today. From this point forward, we're gonna get our hands dirty. Now, this is a first question we get always asked, I'm sure Ace has already fielded this quite a bit, is um, um, we probably have a, a bunch, oh, let me go ahead and hide that, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Uh, that was uh, somebody asked me to show, uh, hide my screen. That might I see my share option. Thank you. Um, what we're going to show here today is the ability to build a number of applications in a Dataverse concept. Now, in the chat window, you're going to see the directions step by step. I built a little tiny ebook, about 20 page ebook, to walk you through the why, uh, but you're definitely going to watch me to do it. Uh, this session is being recorded, so you'll be able to hop around, pause me, and do this in your environment. Now, whether you have access to do this is up to your IT team, but in a moment, we'll show you how you can also access it through the developer plan. So the first app we're going to build is a Dataverse application to do things like managing the projects that you want, uh, seeing all the employees that are entering the contract, the, 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 um, the uh, time cards, and the actual time cards coming in. This is where I can open it up. I can approve certain ones. If I go over here and say, yep, that's approved, uh, save and close, I'm done. So there's other ways of doing approvals also, but we only have three hours together. So we're gonna kind of keep our options a little more limited. This is a model-driven app. Notice you have a lot of options up top, and this is what I mentioned, it might be intimidating for some users. Where our other application, which is a Canvas application, Again, this is going to be built in just a couple hours. We didn't spend a whole lot of time on aesthetics here and making it pretty. But this simple application allows us to go through, select the project we want to build to, say, uh, you know, learning session. I'm going to book uh, three hours today towards that. And when I hit go, our new session will now be logged in here, working on training, boring meeting, and so on and so on. Learning session right there. We can, of course, uh, uh, timestamp this. We can order it. So we're going to do a number of steps like this. The thing to keep in mind in this case is as I go through this and delete things and edit things, there's only so many things that your users can do. And that's where Canvas applications excel. They, when a user looks at this, they can see, well, I'm going to go ahead and do this or I want to do this. There's only so many things to click, right? But three things they can click on inside of here. So what we're going to do next is we're going to build this from the scratch. 
We're going to start by building a Dataverse table. We'll get your environment all hooked up, make sure you're ready to go. We'll also go through, let me go ahead and clean up this real quick. We're also going to go through and create your Dataverse tables, and then we're off to the races. So let's begin. To start with, you're going to want to go to make.powerapps.com. And again, I have a Word doc that's going to walk you step by step through it, and it covers a little bit of the why, but I'm going to explain a lot more why in this video session also. So I'm going to make.powerapps.com. Once you're there, and again, if you don't have access, you can sign up in, uh, if you just, Power Apps Developer Plan, there we go. Uh, Ace is going to be kind enough to put the developer plan in the chat window also. But if you don't have Power Apps today, or you don't have access to some of the premium features, this, this, uh, this plan right here, this white link you're seeing right here, is going to allow you to sign up for the developer plan. The developer plan, if your IT allows you to do this, allows you to have a permanently free environment, does not cost your company any money or any capacity. And you can do whatever premium features that you want to do in that env environment if, you, again, your IT allows you. So once you click on that white link, you'll just click on the sign up for community plan. It will ask you what country you're in, and when you hit accept, it's going to spend a few minutes creating the environment for you. Sometimes this week, I've noticed I've had to do it a few times to finally get that environment. Up here, you've, you'll know it works when you see like ACE's environment, like this. It, again, it might take up to 15, 30 minutes to do its thing. Again, you can always just watch me if you don't want to play around, play along with me. Absolutely fine here. But this environment this is a developer environment, which is forever for free for you. You can also create developer environments in the admin center. Uh, and the admin center you'll notice is in the gearbox right here under admin center. Again, this is at make.powerapps.com. And that admin center allows you under the environment panel on the left side, allows you to create new environments. Once you click on environments here, you'll see the new button, and there's an option right here under new to get the developer plan here. So again, I hit the new button up top and you'll make sure developer plan is selected here. Again, that's a free environment forever for you. Okay. So with our environment all set up, and again, please feel free to pause me. I'm gonna close this little side panel so none of that kicks gets in the way here. We're now ready to play. So our steps to creating a Dataverse set of tables. When we're building a power platform solution, we always want to start on solutions. So I'm going to pick my environment up top. Okay, I've got a fresh new environment called Learn with the Nerds. Okay, so you'll choose that up here. So pick your environment. Make sure that environment does not say the word default. So, so no default. Okay, so make sure that that's the case. Uh, so the, the word, it may say default or something like personal productivity. Likely, you will not have access to do that in that environment. So I'm going to click on solutions on the left side. If you don't see solutions, you might find it also under more. But we're going to select this right here to go to our next step. OK, once we're there, this is a very clean environment. I created this environment about 10 minutes ago, 15 minutes ago, right before we began. What a solution is, is it is a container of everything you need to make your system work. This environment, which we talked about, we didn't really define. This environment is a almost like a server at Microsoft. Everything you want is in this environment. Your users, your apps, your flows, your work, your workflows, your power page stuff, your everything you want is going to be in there. Typically, an environment is like dev, QA, and prod. You'll create one for each for your entire company or your department. We have other sessions on YouTube or also in our learning management system that walks you through best practices around that also. So if I go to solutions, this is gonna be a container that everything I need to deliver my time card to you. In the, uh, in the zip file that was provided to you, you'll find in that zip file, there's a Word doc, which is my step-by-step -step instructions, and a zip file of my final solution as well. So that final solution is one zip file, and all you have to do, don't do this now, 
But all you'd have to do if you want to get all my stuff over is hit the import solution. It's one zip file that you don't decompress, don't uncompress. Everything you want is right there. You would import, hit browse, point to my zip file, and everything you want is there. Now, don't do that now. Let's go ahead and just build this together and have some fun, though. So in this case, I'm going to build a new solution. So the step you're going to do is you'll hit the new solution button right here. Once you have new solution checked, I'll call this like learn with the nerds and we'll call this a uh, uh, time card, something like that. Call it whatever you want though. You're the only one that's gonna see the solution name, you as a developer and your other developers and your team as well would see that solution name. Now, right below this is something called a publisher. And a publisher's job is to say who is responsible for this solution. A publisher should be either a department or a company, but it should not be Brian. The reason why is because everything I create in this solution is going to have the prefix of my publisher. You'll see what I mean in a moment here. So I'm going to hit new publisher because you'll notice the two solutions that are two publishers that are already here are Microsoft solutions. I don't want to put it in there. I don't want to give them credit. I'm going to hit new publisher right here. And I'll call this just Pragmatic Works. Call it your department name or your company name. My name is going to be Pragmatic Works again with no spaces. So again, this is going to have uh, whatever you want to show to, to your other developers. Again, no spaces here. And the last part is the prefix right here. For the prefix, put some type of two-digit qualifier inside of it, like your department name, two- or three-letter qualifier. Ignore the choice prefix. That's for drop-down boxes. will not matter 99% of the time. So, so what I changed, I put pragmatic works. I did without spaces here, and I'm going to put the prefix right here. Now, you'll notice that when I put the prefix on it, every table that's created now will have PW underscore the table name or object name. By doing that, it allows you in Power BI to group all of your assets together. If you're a SQL Server person, this is like a schema name. It's basically a prefix that every object will have on it. So it allows you to find, find your stuff much faster. I'm going to hit the Save button the first time to save my publisher. And then I'm going to select that publisher from the drop-down box right here. So my final screen should look something like this. And I have my display name, my name without spaces, and then my publisher name has been uh, highlighted right there. And then I'll hit Create. Okay, we are going to go a little bit fast because we're doing so much so fast here also. We're going to get through hopefully two, maybe three apps done in this three-hour window. So we got a lot of a lot of heavy lifting. You can imagine if you were to build this, uh, build a, a time card system yourself in .NET or some other mechanism, it might take you weeks, if not months. Now, this is going to be a very basic application, but we're going to do this in three hours, and then you can go live potentially in just a couple of days, potentially. So this is what we do in our hackathons. We build stuff like this with their own, own data like this. Let me close that down in a moment here also. All right. Our solution is now created. And in our solution, we've got a whole bunch of assets here. Now, anytime you're working in the Power Platform, you never want to do something without a solution. You can always retroactively bring your stuff in by hitting Add Existing if you ever wanted to bring your old stuff into the solution at some point. It's going to make it easier, so much easier, for you to move all those assets from dev to QA to production. Solutions also, though, turn on features that you don't have normally. We'll show some of those features a little later also. So we're going to start by creating two tables in this. So these two tables, we're going to have one table for all the projects, and then one table that's going to have the actual time card itself. Now, of course, this time card solution would normally be much more complex and a lot more inside of it. But once you do three or four columns, you're going to get the idea. So we're not going to go too, too deep on that. We'll let you kind of see the, see the few tables move. Uh, and then you know, beat your chest a little bit, and we'll move on to the next step. But of course, in your company, this example will be much more, much more uh, enhanced. So 
We're going to go ahead and start by hitting the new button. Now, again, I'm in my solution. If I accidentally ever got out of the solution like this, I can always go back to solutions and hit that little learn with the nerds time card right there. You can always get back to it. Okay. I'm going to hit the new button right here where I can see all the types of assets that I can build. In my case, though, I'm going to select new table and table. Now, while I do this real quick, I'm going to take a quick time out. We're going to select new table and table. All right. And once you do that, um, it is, you, you may have noticed this external table right below it also. External tables allow you to bring in stuff like SharePoint list and SQL server uh, tables, just to name a few options, right into Dataverse. So it looks like a Dataverse table. But if I were to delete a record, it will push that delete to the underlying data source. It doesn't actually store any data in Dataverse, just the metadata that describes the columns and the, the ways you want to see that. So tables from external data, we're not going to use right now, but they allow you to kind of really have your cake and eat it too. So I'm going to hit new table and table again, not the table from external data. Okay. Once we do this, our first table will be called project. Believe it or not, you are done. You can hit the save button down below for this table in particular. And just watch me for a few seconds if you're playing around. You might have gotten an error at that point saying you do not have permissions to do this, or the new option was grayed out, or the save button is grayed out. If that's grayed out, it means you have an environment selected that does not have access to Power Apps or to the two Dataverse, create Dataverse tables. Things like the system customizer role, uh, web security role would allow you to do that. So find a new environment and try again if that happens to you or sign up for the trial plan with a, with a personal email address. But in my case, I do have access. So I typed in project, always, always, always make sure whatever you put here is singular. So if you put, uh, so no plural names, it will mess you up later when we go to build our applications if we type in projects. So if you look at your table right now and you see projects, not project right here, then go ahead and delete that table and recreate it. You'll notice right below, below it, it does pluralize it right below it. Additionally, something called a primary column, we'll come back to that in our next table. So I'm gonna save this one. So again, always, 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 Make sure it's singular over here. If you made that mistake, I'm gonna hit tables one more time. If I made that mistake, I would hit the three dot and I would delete it, uh, remove it from my environment here. Okay, but you'll notice that once I clicked on it, it came here. We have no more work to do with this right now other than one thing. So again, if you're not here, you wanna go ahead and look over here and click on the word project right there. Now, once you have this open, you'll notice if you slide to the right a little bit, you can see all the columns that Microsoft has created. So we can add other columns right here, hitting the plus button here, or, or looking at the other columns that are out there. Again, we're going to come back to that a little bit later once we build our model-driven app to show you what it looks like. Okay, so next step I'm going to do, I'm going to select the tables again right here. A few ways you can do it. I'm going to select tables right here, and then we're going to go up top again and create a new table just like we did last time. This one's going to be a much more elaborate example where I'll go file, oh, sorry, new table and table again. This table is going to be called time space card. Okay, notice below it has pluralized it. So make sure again, singular here each time. Now there's a few things you want to, we want to look at here as part of this. The first thing is, what is this primary name column? I told you I'd come back to it, now's the time. The default primary name column is name. Now, the primary name column is what represents a unique record. Uh, now, it's not a system uh, record. It is how you and I are going to communicate. So if I call you about a project, what is the best way I can convey that to where you can pull that project up? In that case, it's probably the project's name, right? The name column. In our time card case, hey, I'm calling to get this time card approved. Think about what you would, what, 
What does this mean when I'm reading this over the phone to you? If this is best described as a project name, then you, you keep the name column like you have right here, type in project name or whatever. If it's best as a, a number instead, then let me call this time card number like that. So in this case, I'm going to use time card number, and that is going to be an auto number that we're going to set. This can either be an auto number or it can be a text string like we have here. <clears throat> uh, time card number, though, does not have to be a unique value. Okay, somebody's honking their horn outside over and over again. All right, so uh, in this case, it is going to be an auto number. We'll do the auto number in just a moment. We have not defined it as an auto number yet, but we're going to define that a little bit later. Let's go back to properties again. So I was just over in primary column. Now I'm going to go back to properties. Notice here, let's explore a few more options that we don't really need. But I'm going to explore these just so you can see additional information that you can do on this table. First thing you'll notice is we can enable attachments right here. By enabling attachments, this allows you to go through and turn on attachments so you can upload, hey, this is a client signature for this, or here's a PDF I was working on. Here's my artifact that I created during this time block. We also see this used for storing things like CAD drawings or uh, images or PDFs, or if you're an inspector, all the images of the flaws of this. If I go over to advanced options, we can see behind the scenes the name in SQL Server of this table. And as we scroll down, I'm also gonna turn on creating a new activity right there under advanced options. So when I check that box, you are safe to hit the create button now. Okay, at this point we're done making changes. But I just want to kind of show you a few more things on camera that you can do. Okay, so don't do any of these changes I'm gonna click on. I just clicked on create new changes and I would normally hit save, but I'm gonna show you a few option, extra options. One is the option, my favorite option here, is to audit changes to the data. So as ACE goes through and changes their, their amount of hours they booked from 40 hours to 40 to 4,000 hours, we can log the fact that ACE made that change on this day. They logged into the application. They went to the screen. They changed it from her, their salary from $40,000 to $400,000. They hit save and all that is logged. So that's one option you can do. We can also log these large files into SharePoint. So every time I create a new client, or in my case, a time card, it will create a folder that I can store those, those uh, files into. So that way I'm using the space from SharePoint, not the space from Dataverse. There's lots more around that that we can discuss, but just a heads up on that one piece. Creating a new activity, what this allows us to do, is it allows us to, to when we look at a time card, we can start conversations about that time card. We can log phone calls, log emails about the time card. We can log appointments about it. All those things can be logged on a given record. So those are the big highlights here. I'm gonna hit save here. And our second table has now been created. Now, as we go through and create this table, we have a number of columns that we're going to knock out now. Let's start by going to columns. A few ways you can get there. One is you can expand time cards, click on column. The other way is click on columns in the middle section here. So whether you're more comfortable expanding the left or go in the center, you do what works for you, okay? And you'll notice there's a lot of columns that Microsoft has created for you in Dataverse. This is one of the advantages of Dataverse. It has things like row level security to where you only see your own data. It has things like business unit level security where you only see your data and any customers or any, anybody else in your department potentially. It also has hierarchical security where a CFO can see her, her department and any department underneath her. It has all that and it has column level security where I can lock down the salary column to where only HR is allowed to edit it and only finance can see it potentially. So you can get really granular on your security. 
I have yet to find a scenario where Dataverse cannot handle the security concepts. The brilliant thing is it's simple checkboxes to knock it out and they're making it easier. You'll also see that it has tons of auditing built in this, like who created the record, who modified the record, who owns that record, which may be different than the creator. Now, for me, the first thing I always do when I get here, I don't want to see all this junk that Microsoft created. I just want to see my junk. So I'll select right here where you see the name column right here. And I'll say filter by. Now, remember that prefix I created earlier? It was called PW in my case. I'm going to hit filter by and type in PW and then hit apply. Now, I'm just seeing the two tables or two columns, excuse me, that I created in this case. One is called time card number and one is called time card ID. Now, time card number is my primary name column about how you and I are going to communicate, where time card is a unique identifier that is guaranteed to be unique across our environment. This is how all of our links will have the time card ID in that link. So up top, when you look at the URL, it'll say you're editing time card ID equals, and we'll have this long, long string GUI behind it. Now, I mentioned before, I wanted this to be an auto number. So if I select time card number, I hit the hyperlink right here for it. It's going to open up a side pane, and we'll see it the, as I look at this, the data type right now is a single line of text. I'm going to change that into an auto number. And you can also add descriptions on it and all those kind of goodies. And as I scroll down, we also, though, can put prefixes on this. So if I do a T for my prefix, look what happens. Every row underneath it will have T1000, 1001, and so, so on, and so on. Why would I ever want T1000 in that? It's like a Terminator uh, robot, doesn't it? So if you, want to, if you want to identify what type of record it is, a good, pref a good option is to prefix that data. Imagine you're an HR group and you have somebody calling about T1000. You immediately know that because they said the word T, or letter in front, T in front, it must be a time card where I call about A1000, I'm calling about my application for employment. So this allows you to kind of look at the data and find one that works for you. I'm gonna save this and it's gonna now change this to an auto number. Right now it's a single line of text that will then become auto number in a moment. There we go. Now we're gonna go through and create a few more columns. And again, this is all in your Word doc. You'll see right here, I have these columns listed right there. Ace, if you don't mind, would you mind putting those in the chat window for the team so they can go ahead and uh, uh, copy and paste if they so chose? But additionally, you can also go through and do that yourself if you like as well. So my first column up top, when I'm in columns, I'll hit new column and I'll call this column, um, how about I call this one project? What project are you billing time to? So um, this data type, notice all these data types are available to you. Again, the goal was to make it to where anybody can build these tables out. So my first column, I want to connect this table to my project table. So I'll call it, uh, uh, again, change single line text to lookup and lookup. So in this case, my column name is project. I'm going to go lookup and then lookup again. With that done, it's gonna ask you, well, which table do you wanna connect this to? Where it says related table right here, I'll click inside of here and type in project, and hopefully it will go out there and find my project table. All right. With that done, you can hit the save button. Your first column has been created. Our next column is what employee is logging time. Now there's a few ways we can do this. We could look up against, a, we, can, we can store their employee's email address. We could also connect that into another entity, for example, like the contact entity or the user entity. So I'm gonna create another column again, I'll call this employee. And this is going to be a lookup again and look up again. This time though, I'm gonna connect it to the contact table. Now there's a few options I had here again. 
Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna freeze here a second, zoom in. I change this, this, and this. What are my other options here? Well, I chose the contact table. Why would I have my employees in a contact table? The contact table is a table that Microsoft has created for you to store all of your all of your people inside of. There's already over a hundred columns inside that table. And yes, you can extend it and add your own columns to that as well. There's also tables like the user table. The user table store, stores any user that has a license of Power Apps in this environment. The other table is AAD users. This stores a link to your Active Directory and all the, all the uh, Active Directory users that are there so if I hit the drop down box, I would see Marshall, Ace, and everybody in the company right there live. So why did I choose context instead of one of these other two tables? If I chose one of these other two tables, it would automatically have a list of those users. The reason I chose context though in this case was because I want to not, not corner myself into a corner here or put myself into a corner. I want to make it where I can eventually store this data and have my contractors come in through a power page, even though they don't have a Pragmatic Works email address. I want them to be able to come in without being authenticated into my Active Directory and log records. So if I have contractors, I have a consultant coming in, I want them to be able to, to, to log into a power page eventually and log their time card also. If I put this data in contacts, contacts will eventually also hold that contractor's username and password. So by using these in the contact table in this case, I am no longer in a corner. This is not just going to be an externally facing application, but also potentially an internally facing application. So I'll hit the save button here. All right, that one is now done. All right. so. Our next one is going to be an interesting one also. So we have our, our, our employee now logged, our project now logged. Our next one is going to be the description of the work they did. So I'll hit new column. I'll type description. This one, I'm going to make a text column. But when I make it text, this I'll, I'll do this little right arrow. And I'm going to make it multiple lines of text. I'll zoom in again, again here in case you have eyes like me. I'll go plain text text and the description column here. Now you can also use rich text, but they have a full word editor to kind of maintain and make any kind of changes that you wish. But in our case, we're choosing to use this route to, uh, because I don't want to have all this HTML stuff inside of my, uh, my, my information. So I'm going to keep, I'm going to go with plain text because of that. So again, really simple description, multi-line text, and then save. You're almost done. We have three more columns to go. Our next column is going to be how many hours you worked. So I'll call this hours worked. This is just going to be, we can make it a number, but make sure you make it a decimal number, not a whole number. In case I worked a quarter hour or half an hour or something, I should get credit for that. So I'll make this a decimal. You'll also notice, by the way, under advanced options, that you can have a whole bunch of data validation. Like, can you do a negative hour? No, you can't do negative hours. So I'll make that a zero right there. That's a minimum value. Can, do you want to do column security where only certain people can edit that? You can check that if you wanted to. Let's definitely not do that right now. But for salary columns, that's a really useful option. I'll hit save. All right, two more to go. What date was this build? We have the date it was recorded but that may be different than the date it was recorded. So I'm gonna hit new column again. We'll select a uh, build date this time. This is going to be a date column, a date only. I don't care about the time you logged it, just the date you logged it. Now in this case, so make sure this says date only. It's gonna save you some, some work later, but one more piece I wanna do because of the time zone challenges here, I'm gonna hit the advanced options and I'm going to change this user uh, uh, local here to date only also. That is one more little gotcha. So again, I changed uh, bill date, date and time, date only, and date only. 
The reason why I had the stuff down below is because of time zones. If you don't do that, it's still going to prompt you for a time in many of the applications. So by doing it this way, you're only prompted for the date, not for the time. So I'm going to go ahead and save that now. Now, why this is saving? A few things also. Uh, as Ace, wow, already 350 chat messages already. Thank you, Ace, for covering those. Uh, as, as they go through and, and, and do that, the more you chat and the more you uh, converse in that chat window, we have a, a raffle. We're going to do it to two raffles today, one at the break at 1230, and then one again at the end of the presentation, where you'll have a, a chance to win a free subscription to our on-demand platform. And we'll show you what it looks like uh, later today. Um, and we're going to draw that from those that are conversing with, with uh, or asking questions, or talking, or doing, saying how cool things are, whatever you want to do, how, how bad things are, whatever. Doesn't matter. So if, you, if, you, if you're, if you're uh, chatting at all, it, puts you, it gives you an a, 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 a entry in the raffle later today. All right. Sorry, Ace. I made your 350 messages now, 900 messages probably. All right. So. So to start with here, we have one, one more column to do. Was this approved or not approved? So think about this application. We can, If I'm a con contracting company or a consulting company, I can have all my consultants log this, this time in the application, the internal application using Canvas. My external folks, my contractors can use the Power Page and my, uh, my customers can approve that time potentially in the Power Page also. So let's go ahead and create a simple column called approval status. All right, the drop down box for data type this time will be choice and choice. And for this, I'm going to go ahead and scroll down and you'll see new choice right here. So make sure it says it's global choice. I think other applications might need this, this drop down box eventually also. So what I'm doing right here by creating a global choice, I'm creating a drop-down box that any application in this environment can also use. So I'm going to select new choice. Now, one of my rules of thumb here is I always like to go ahead and um, uh, approval status, and I'll put the word choice at the end. This makes it easier for you later to find this. So always put the word, at least my standard at least, is to always put the word uh, choice at the end of any choice that you create. I'll create three choices here. One will be called uh, pending. Next one will be called approved. And I'm hitting new choice each time. And the last one is rejected. Again, all I've changed was this approval status choice. And I created by hitting this new choice button here, I created these three choices right here. Remember before in your publisher, you had that, that, uh, that choice prefix. These are the numbers right here that, that came from that, in case you're curious. Now you're ready to hit save here. Just note that you can also do things like change the color of these choices, if you so chose. And by you, by you doing that, the applications can later interact with that if you wanted to also, and, and see that color overlaid on top of your choices. I'm gonna hit save though for the time being and set the default. Oh, sorry. I'm going to go ahead and select my choice. This is why I've named it choice. If I click inside of here and start typing in the word choice, it comes right up and I can see my, my options right there. We can also set the default. Uh, whenever somebody inserts a record, I'm going to make it pending right here. All right. So let me zoom in again. Approval status, choice right there for data type. Then I'm going to say global choice. I created my global choice. And yes, we can always edit it later if we wanted to. And then I set my, my default to pending. By making that default as pending, or, uh, it will every new record will have pending on its status type. Hit save to go ahead and commit all that. Now you'll notice as soon as you did that, there's going to be a new area on the left side here. And it's going to have, in a moment here, there it goes. And... Oh, it's going to be here in just a few seconds here. Um, we'll have a choices section over here also. There it is. Took a while for it to show up here. So that's where I can go and edit those choices anytime I want. And again, any of those choices I edit will reflect across any application using it. In addition, you'll notice on the left side, I've got contacts here. Why is contacts here? I didn't create a contact table. The minute you went ahead and referred to the contact table, it, is, it went ahead at that point, and it is using that 
as a stub where you can extend it if you wanted to. So this contact table, you'll notice that if I go to columns here, there's nothing here, but there's tons inside the contact table. This is just showing a stub of everything I, I, I need in this case. So if I wanna add new columns to the contact table, I can most certainly do that. If I wanna change the columns that are already there, I can add an existing column and then add my, and then click on it and then modify it if I so chose. Most common application for that would be things like uh, adding in like a contact type. This is a teacher, a contractor, an employee, or whatever. So those kinds of, those are ways you can do that. Now, for some reason, I'm spinning out of control right now, this little hourglass. So I'm just gonna refresh my browser, see if it comes back now in this case. Okay, so we have now created all the tables that we need and all the columns in those tables. We're now ready to work on our model-driven application. Our steps for creating a model-driven application are first of all, to create our tables, which we just did, create our views to see the data, and our forms to enter the data. We're, and then we, lastly, we create the applications on top of it. So we're gonna start with this time card table. So what I want you to do is go to time card, expand it, and go to views first, right on the left side. You'll see time card and then views. If you don't see that, go back to your solution and then go pick the right solution. You'll find it there. By the way, you can always also select views up top and switch between views and forms here if you so chose also. Now there's a number of views that Microsoft has created for you. Okay, so I'm in the view section right there. Some of those, the most common view you're gonna be messing with is active, whatever your table name is. This active, whatever your table name is, time cards, will show you all the records that are presently active, that have not been archived. Where the inactive ones are gonna show you deactivated records that you may want to soft delete, meaning you're archiving the records. There's other ones here. We do have a whole class on Molder and Apps. We show you more about each of these. And you can also create the perfect view for yourself right here if you so chose. I'm gonna to choose to go to the active time cards right here, and we're gonna create our own view here. Now, again, let me make sure I show this one more time for those that may have missed that. I'm under tables and time cards, and I click on views. You can also access it in the middle section right here. You'll see views right there as well. Once you're there, click on active time cards. This opens up your designer, and this designer is gonna allow you to kind of manipulate things just like you do an Excel spreadsheet. You can go and if I zoom in here, just like an Excel, you can drag those, make it smaller, bigger. You can say, I'm gonna remove that, and, and I don't care about that column by hitting, by right-clicking on it and removing it. There we go. You can also see on the left side, there's a lot of columns here. What I'm gonna do, is I'll hit this drop down box right here where it says the filter icon, and I'll select custom. But once I do that, once I set custom, I'm only gonna see the stuff that I have created. And all the Microsoft stuff goes away at that point. So I'm gonna go ahead and select, um, um, uh, I'm gonna put the employee, how many hours they worked, on what project, and when did they do it, and has it been approved. That's good enough for now. We can also add other columns. Keep in mind, this is not, you're not trying to show every column here. You're just trying to show a high level information and they can click on that data to go deeper. On the right side, you can sort it and filter it, or you can filter it and sort it by just hitting the columns and saying sort and filter. We can always drag things around just like this. You can resize things or you can hit the down arrow and remove things at any point in time. Okay, or you can right click, either way. If you forgot to add a column, you can also add columns by hitting new table column right here also. With that first table done, you now have created a way of seeing the data. Hit save and publish in the top right. This is gonna take a few seconds to save and publish. And what's happening right now, if we did that, any application using this view, and you might have an employee's view with tons and tons of applications, 20 applications all using it. If I modified it, changing the way the data was sorted, or changing the filter, adding a column, sorting it, whatever I wanna do, 
If I were to do that, every one of those 20 applications would also reflect that new change. That's the power of Dataverse, is you do it once and it rolls out for everything. And all, all my, a lot of my business logic is in Dataverse. I'm, as soon as it saves and published, I'm gonna hit the back button up in the top left. All right. Hey, so you're, you're busy right now. 500 questions. Again, if there's anything that you think that would be useful for other people, feel free to star it and I'll answer those questions in the uh, in the chat window also, or in, uh, uh, verbally here as well. Oh, there's one our first coming in. All right. So uh, question here again. What if you didn't want a default choice? Great question. So if you didn't want a default choice, it's a question from Tom coming in, then just leave it alone. If you say none, it will just it, that that option will be null for you as you do that. So no worries at all if you so to chose that. Thank you, Tom. Great, great one to flag there, Ace. Thank you so much. Any as much as you wanted that, no problem at all. All right, so we've now got our view now done. We have our columns now done. Now we need a way for our users to edit and insert and delete the data. So to do that, we're going to create a form. Again, you can select right here under views and go to forms that way, or you can select forms on the left bar, whatever's comfortable for you. Now, again, there's three forms here. The one that you're going to care about, again, I'm in under forms right here. The one you care about is the main form. So yours might not be the third form here. So look whatever one is main. And as soon as you identify the main one, go ahead and click on the word information right there. Now, you may have noticed there's more than just forms and views inside of the left side. There are also dashboards and charts. You have things like relationships, how you relate tables. There's keys for looking for duplication of data. There's also things like uh, uh, business rules you can create also. So uh, great question here from Jeff. So the question is, what happens if I remove a column? Does it also delete all the data within that or does it not allow uh, you to view that? So if you delete a column within that view, so I think the question that Jeff is asking is I'm looking at the view here. Okay. If I were to remove it from here, it will not delete the data or change the, the actual data in any way. It just changes your view on the data. If I were to delete the column from the column list, then yes, that data will disappear at that point. It's a great question, Jeff. Thanks for asking that. Go ahead and hide that now. Uh, so two different ways of thinking about it. I'm not sure which one you're asking, but I just want to make sure I ask the right one there also. All right. So cool. To create our form, I'm going to go back to forms, and I'm going to click on the word information under main. Now watch how fast we can build a form. Okay, right now, East Coast time, it is 11.53. I'm going to hit the drop down box again to say only custom. And then you see where it says time card number right here? This little panel here, I want to click on time card number and make this read only. So I'm going to select time card number on the right side. I'll check read only. This puts a little, um, a little lock and key next to it. So again, click on that and then mark it as read only. By doing that, it will auto number. I don't want my users to feel like they have to go in there and type a number into there. If you do not make it read only, the users will feel obligated to type something in and they will mess your data up. So keep it simple. Additionally, on the left side, I'm just going to go through and go click, 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 click all the way down on the, my columns that I created. And you'll see it been ahead and moved it around. You can then drag and drop them however you want. And I'm basically constructing a form here. We have trained tons of business users, tons of, of users that are technical. I very rarely found a problem where a business user can't figure this out very easily. Usually within a half an hour, they are building forms for themselves. It is amazing to watch. Now, this owner is who owns the record, and I can click, drag, and hold it. And if it turns light purple up top, you can also move stuff up to the top header right here. So when you're done, hit Save and Publish up in the top right. It is now 11.55. Two minutes have passed, and you have now built your first 
dataverse form, model-driven form in this case. This form we just built will be used in model-driven apps and in Power Pages. The view we just we built can be used in model-driven apps, Canvas apps, uh, Power Pages, uh, every type of app you want to build, it will work in there for you. All right. So it also works in Excel and those kind of areas. So change it once, reflect it across the board. Now, just to kind of take a quick time out here, we have, you're done. So you can save and publish and then hit the back button, you're done. But I just want to show you again, on the left side here, you can create your own columns right here if you wanted to, again. You can hit the up top here, it says components. This allows you to add new components, like new tabs. See, now I have a new tab right there. It allows you to build new tabs. And I can go through and do other stuff as well. So if I wanted to create a new tab here, and I want to put any kind of attachments of this, I can drag this timeline over. Don't worry about doing this. It doesn't matter. We're not going to use this at all. So this timeline right here lets you go through and add things like activities, notes, uh, appointments, phone calls, emails about that given time card. We can also go over and, and select the tab and rename it to, you know, notes or something like that. Again, I'm not going to, none of this matters. I'm not going to actually keep any of this stuff. There's Power BI integration where you can bring in Power BI reports. There's AI integration. There's lots more components you have at the bottom as well. If you're a coder like ACES, we can also go through and add things like JavaScript libraries to this. We can add business rules to this without JavaScript. We can also securitize this. Is that a word? Securitize? It is now. We can also go to form settings and say, all right, who can access this form? Anyone or just people that have a certain security role? So lots of options you have in here. And when I save and publish this, it is now pushing that out to all those sources out there. So it is now done. I'm going to hit the back button just like you. And oh, great question here from Elizabeth. What happens if you accidentally remove a column from the column list? Is there a way to uh, retrieve it if uh, uh, retrieve the data lost? Yes, if I go back here again, and I if I accidentally delete a column by hitting the delete key or hitting the pro, the, uh, the, pro, the uh, uh, delete button right here also, this little trash can button when I do up here, see so the trash can. At any point, you'll notice that my project should be back here again. You just simply click on it again or drag and drop it, and it will move that right back for you. So at any point, it's almost impossible to mess this stuff up, Elizabeth. So it's, 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 you can do it, of course, but it makes things a little bit easier as you go through these to do that. All right, I'm going to again, save and publish, make sure I did that, and then I'll hit the back button again. All right. Let me hit that back button. Woo! Almost 600 comments now. You guys are rocking. Thank you, Ace. Ace is uh, keeping busy. Now, it is the top of the hour. We're going to do a break in about a half an hour here. But it is exactly top of the hour right now. Look at your clock. Watch how fast we can build this model-driven application. All the hard work is done. We have got the form done, the view done, and the columns done. All the business logic is, is inside of here. So now we're going to go back to the all section right here. We're going to hit all. We're going to hit new app and model driven app. So I went to all, new app, model driven app. Name this app whatever you want to name it. Doesn't matter. And once you do that, uh, we're going to go through and we're going to modify the application. So I am going to start building this right now, file new and model driven app. We'll do a Canvas one next also. I'll name mine uh, Timekeeper Admin, maybe. And then I'll hit Create. Of course, you want to put a description on it. And of course, you can put things like, uh, we can put things like icons on it later as well. We'll call this Timekeeper Admin. This application we're building will work on your phone on anybody that wants a link to so a browser or a PC, Mac, it doesn't matter. All right, to create our application, simply hit the new button here, here, or here. Either way, I'm gonna hit the one right in the middle here, it says add page. Once I hit add page, notice we can add things like dashboards, we can add Canvas stuff to this as well. That's, that's our Canvas items right there. 
We can add links to this, web resources, our HTML pages, URLs, dashboards, all that stuff is right here. I'm gonna to point to our Dataverse tables where I'm gonna search for my contact table, my project table, and my time card table, the, one, the three tables that we have used. So again, you search right here for time card, contacts, and then lastly, project. Okay, or project, excuse me. Once you do that, hit the add button. And you'll also see this is group, all these tables right here are grouped together. If you want to change that group on the left side, you see new group. We can select that new group and give it a, give it a better name, like uh, time cards or whatever. Okay, there we go. So it changes that right there. So I simply selected it on the left side, changed it on the right side. Believe it or not, you're done. It is now 12.01, based on my clock at least. And at 12.01, in about two minutes there, we have finished the application. So go ahead and hit the publish button in the top right. We're gonna come back to this in a moment. We're gonna I'm gonna show you some additional things inside of here. You may notice that I have some sample data in here as well. If you don't have sample data, I'm gonna show you in just a few seconds how you can add some sample data also. My sample data is only in the contacts table, but in the projects or time cards, I have no sample data. So to do this, what I want to show you is some additional things that you can do. Notice that when I select projects on the right side, it's showing me all the, 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 the uh, views that are available to your users. Should they be able to hit the drop down box and see archive projects? That's up to you. You can hide it by just setting the three dot and saying remove, and it will hide it from this application. You might also have like in the contacts table, look at all these, my goodness. So you may not want them to see all these views or they don't pertain to your application. Just hit the three dot and remove it. In addition, we can see things like uh, any kind of automations you have in place. You can do other stuff in this application also, but most of the business logic is in those tables. Nothing more to do so far, but hit the play button. So I'm gonna hit that play button right there and it's gonna open up the application. Question from Julie, adding Power BI to this, it will allow us to create a graphs to show where the, the uh, where you're spending your time. Can we also go through and use, uh, uh, use a plan view tool or some other third party tool application like that? So yes, when I open up the application, we could have Power BI reports in this and dashboards in this, Power BI dashboards to see our data. If you want to ex access from a monitor an app, Plan View, for example. Your best bet is to build Power BI reports on top of Plan View and then link to it here. So you would have a dashboard button right here. And then, Julie, what you would do is you would, one of those reports would be your Plan View report. So you have one version of the truth there. You can also, though, when I'm looking at a view at any point, hit Visualize This View, and it will then open up a Power BI report about the view that you're looking at right now. This is more of an ad hoc report. Hopefully, Julia, I kind of got you started on that. We do have some videos that show you more information. You can also weave those into your forms if you so chose also. Okay, so once this, once this opens up, it's done right now and it builds basically an ad hoc report. This takes about 30 seconds. We're not gonna show too much about it, but I just wanna show you that you can ad hoc build whatever Power BI report that you so chose takes a few seconds. You can then check on different things like the email and it will start to open up those. Oh goodness, it's taking its time, isn't it? All right. Well, in an effort to save time, I'm going to close this, but just note it would be a Power BI report showing you the view and helping you slice and dice that data. All right. So what if I don't see any data right now? Well, if you don't see any data, let me show you a little backstage way of adding the sample data if you want to. I'm gonna hit the gearbox, the top right, and go to advanced settings. It's going to open up a new tab for me. And this advanced settings is gonna let me see all the backstage stuff for Power Apps. I hit the down arrow, we're on settings right here, and then go to data management. So again, the down arrow and then data management. Boom, and then boom. 
Then I'm going to go through and hit sample data. Now, in my case, the sample data is already installed, which I can remove at any point. In your case, though, you'll, you might see install sample data. It's not required for this session, but if you click on that, it's going to install some companies and some contacts for you. In my case, though, in an effort to make this a little better for myself here, I'm going to hit the new button under contacts when I'm playing the application. And I'm going to build a, a user for me, Brian. All right, nice. There we go. And then I'll go through and add my email address in here. All right, perfect. And I'll I have other stuff inside of here as well. Okay, that's good enough. All, all you want to do right now is add your, your first last name and your email address in the application. We're going to use that later. If you want to add a coworker, that's your prerogative also. You can hit save and close up top to leave that. So if I want to go and add like a Devon Knight, for example, Oop. all right. And then I'll put his email address in here. You might have guessed what his email address might be. I'll hit save and close. And now I have two of them. There's a few neat things you can do here also. As you're looking at uh, these records, you can also hop around very easily. You can export all this data to Excel. You can also import this data from Excel as well. And on the left side, we'll see projects. You can kind of hop around here very, very easily. I'm gonna also go through my projects here and add one or two projects that I can play with here. So I'm gonna click on projects, hit new up top, and I'll call my first project here. How about I call it uh, new HQ building? All right, save and close. Then I'll hit new again, and I'll create another project here called, um, I don't know, um, Ace is new, I'll call it uh, uh, Dynamics Rollout. Call it whatever you want. None of this matters. I'm just creating a few projects here. A shortcut you could do if you wanted to is you could hit the three dot right here. Imagine you had the project list already inside an Excel spreadsheet. I can hit the right arrow next to Export to Excel and say Open in Excel Online. This will show you your data, my two projects in Excel Online, where as I type in project two, project three, and so on and so on, it is actually going to write that back to the database. So I can copy and paste from Excel into this environment and, all right, Ace is new Lambo. All right, there we go. As I hit save and save right here at the bottom, it's going to start to load that data now into the Dataverse database. It's going to look for any kind of problems, and I can watch it do it by hitting Track Progress. I can see it each step along the way and hit that little refresh button every so many minutes, seeing it's parsing the data now. Then it's going to transforming. It found five rows. It also, by the way, handles deletes and updates for you as well. So all that is handled automatically for you when you look at that, uh, uh, that Excel option. Not much, it's not a must do here. It's, it's taking its sweet time, so I'm gonna leave that real quick. But again, to get that, you hit the, hit the three dot, export to Excel, hit the right arrow, and then open in Excel online. There's also dynamic worksheets that can do the same thing for you. After about five minutes, or it takes about yeah, anywhere from two minutes to five minutes to do this. After it does that, Simply hit the refresh button and you'll see your new rows now out there. So lots of options you have inside of here. I'm just gonna refresh every so often and I'm getting impatient. I'll come back to it later. We'll see those projects in there. The time card, what I wanna show you in the time card piece that you don't have to do is if I hit the new button here, you'll notice in my notes section here, let me just create one little time card here. I'll put Brian Knight, the project will be the dynamics rollout, whatever. Don't do this, guys. It's just I'm just trying to show you something really quickly here. And they worked three hours on that project. And when I save this record, I'm going to go to notes. I'm going to save the record. Notice that the timeline lights up where I can hit the plus button. And you can see all the details about all these right here if you so chose. Okay. Back in projects, there's my projects now loaded now from Excel. Just took it about five minutes or so to load those. Your first app is done. Awesome. Now we're ready to build our next application, which is going to be a Canvas. This is going to be the application we're looking at here uh, is the application for the administrators. But the application we're going to look at in the other interface will be for the employees, the ones that don't want to see all these buttons up top. 
That's the application we're going to create next. So I'm going to go over to time key. I'm going to go back to the, the, uh, the previous tab we had open and hit the back button to get back to our solution. If you don't want to do that, you can hit the, you know, you can always come back here again, again, make.powerapps.com. Then go to the learn with the nerds, uh, whatever, whatever your environment was, go to solutions and then pick your solution. Either way, it gets you back to the same, the same environment. All right. Next, you can hit go to apps and you'll see there's your app right here. Select new app and then Canvas applications. So this time it's a little different. Last time we did the model driven, we went to app, new app and Canvas this time. Just like last time, name it whatever you wish. So I'll call mine a uh, timekeeping application. You call it whatever you want. Notice I'm making this tablet friendly at first. These applications will work on a phone device also. So just because I'm making it tablet here doesn't mean it won't work on a phone. It is going to be, it could, it can be responsive if I can figure it in such a way to make it responsive to where it works on a phone, tablet automatically. By default, it will just compress the, the application down to where it looks good on a phone. But you can make it look as large as you want and actually do that as well. All right, so I'm going to hit the Create button. All right, so question here from uh, somebody in the audience here. All right, the GIST lobby. All right, nice name there. So the uh, question was, for time cards, would a user be able to create multiple time cards across multiple dates? And just one. Absolutely. We're going to build it just that way. We're going to make it where they can do just that. that that's, our, that's our goal for today. All right. When this pops up right here, we can go ahead and say, don't ever show this again and click on skip. It might not show up for you. That's absolutely fine. So the application, this is Power Apps Canvas environment. And the first thing I always do when I first get here is you may want to go and hit the save button in the top right just to make sure you have one the option saved for you. So that way, auto save will kick in going forward. Now, what do we want to start here with is we're going to build a three zone application or really a four zone app. We're going to have up top here our little header. All right, here we go. On the side, we're going to have a list of our projects over here. All right, uh, then we're going to break the right pane into two zones. We're trying to squeeze as much as we can into one screen. So there's less clicking for our users. Time cards are a pain in the butt for users, right? So because of that, we want to make it as condensed as possible. It may not look the prettiest, but it'll be functional. And our users will thank us because they won't have to go to five different screens to do this. Up top, we're going to build an app. We're going to build our form to enter new time cards. So let's be for insert edit of time cards. On the bottom, we're going to list all time cards for the project selected. Okay, so these are our really four zones of the application. To manage these zones, we're going to use something called containers. And containers allow you to make a responsive application that will slide left and right, right based on, on, on this, the, the user screen here. So hopefully now you'll see screen one. We're gonna remove that in a moment, don't worry. But on the left side, let's kind of walk through some of the navigation here. On the left side, you'll see your tree view here. The tree view, let me, I'll, I'll expand this so you can see it here. There we go, all right. The tree view is going to give you a listing of all the objects inside of your application. Right now, I only have one object and that's screen one right now. The insert view shows you a list of all the objects you could add to the, the application. So I can add a, a text label by just dragging and dropping if I wanted to. Don't worry, we're gonna delete the screen. <laughs> you could drop in a, a rectangle or a whatever. And you see how it feels a little bit like power, about like power, um, um, uh, PowerPoint, excuse me. On the left side, but, but next to that, you'll see data. This is where we can add our tables, our connected connections to other data sources like plan view, all those things can be added here. Our logo and other types of images will go under media. Power Automate is how you'll go through and link things over to workflows. So you hit submit. I'm gonna now send this out for approval at that point. 
The variables, self-explanatory. These are how you can add and create variables and, and other and collections later also. We can do there. Advanced tooling, you'll, we won't come into this until you get to be a little, a little more higher level. This is where you can monitor the application and you can also search down here as well. Now, I, first thing I wanted to do is go to our tree view. Okay, I'm gonna collapse this. So this icon that you see right here, we're gonna hit new screen and we're gonna select the, the three-pronged uh, three one right here, the sidebar template. So again, I went to tree view, I hit new screen right here, and we're gonna go ahead and so right there, and we're gonna select the sidebar piece right there. Okay, once we do that, it's going to create a new screen called screen two. Oh, and let me, I gotta close that Teams there. It keeps on popping up there, doesn't it? Let me go ahead and quit that. Teams like, you can't quit me. All right, there we go. So for this, we have screen one and screen two. Let's go ahead and delete screen one by hitting the three dot next to it and selecting delete. So now we just have our one screen here and it's called screen two. Now, at any point in time, you can also rename these objects. You can double click on screen two or select the three dot and hit rename. What I'd like to typically do is have a, a three letter qualifier like SCR for screen. And what is this doing? This is doing my entry in this case. So you can call it whatever you want. I'm calling mine SCR entry. The reason I use that three letter qualifier is called a Hungarian notation is it makes it to where um, if I type in up top, I just check this out. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna put some in arbitrary here to ignore what I'm doing right now. If I put this button up here and I put in something like navigate, which navigates me new to a new screen, and I open parenthesis it, it knows I see the SCR or obvious screen names here. So it makes it much easier to kind of find my stuff ultimately. So doing that makes a, a much easier to navigate around. The next thing I want you to do, okay, so your screen should look something like this, just three little panels here. These are containers where I can move things around. A little more navigation help also. Notice up top, we have a navigation, a little pane here. It shows me whatever I select here, it shows me what is in context of whatever I have selected, okay? Like changing your theme or whatever. On the right side here, you'll see your properties window. This is showing you what properties you have uh, currently selected. So I hit my container right here. I'm seeing all the properties for the container. Speaking of properties, I'm gonna have you over and over again, go to something called the property dropdown box. Up in the top left, once you select something, your property dropdown box is gonna be called it's gonna be right here. So when I say go there, you are gonna forget this, I promise. This, I'm gonna to refer to this as the property dropdown box up here, okay? A very fancy name, but that's, when I say that, go there. Now, there's also a settings section right here where we can go and set the settings, the size of the, of the application, all that. And lastly, you'll see a play button in your top right, as well as your save button and your publish button. We could be working on version 20 of this application by hitting save, 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 20, 21, 22, each time we hit save. However, nobody can see our changes until we hit the publish button, okay? That means that, that, that everything rolls forward and the minute you publish, it now shows up on your phone and other users that have access to this that you shared this with will also change. The play button allows you to preview the application. You can not only preview it, but you can try the application on different kind of devices here as well, okay? So also as you preview, you'll notice that as you exit, it's gonna say, hey, by the way, did you know that you can hold the Alt key down and interact with the application? We'll see that later today also. So the first thing I want you to do is click on the settings button right here. The settings button, will show you all the settings, the icons that you want to use, auto saves turned on, all those kind of things. What we're going to turn on though, under settings, so I hit settings right here, yours might be in the bottom left of your screen, looking for a little gearbox icon there. So if you don't see it up top here, 
hit the three dot. So settings might be hidden underneath the three dot, or it also might be in the left panel on the very bottom. What I want you to do is toggle this modern controls and themes on. This is going to allow you to go out and notice as soon as I did that, it's showing a whole bunch of new themes that I have access to right here. Uh, it has an insert button where I can have a new controls available to me. So this gives me a lot more options I can play with now. Okay. Let's first of all, get things kind of laid out the way we want though. So I'm gonna first of all, stay in tree view. I'm gonna select this right section. Remember the right section? We wanted to have two bars here. We want to have the form up top and we want to have the old records down below. So I'm to do that, I'm going to create a, a two more containers, a container within a container. It's like inception, man. It's crazy. All right. So anyways, I'll select the main container. I'm going to go hit the insert button here, or you can hit the plus button right here. Either way, it does the same thing. I'll go to classic. And I'm going to search for vertical container right there. So again, you can do it by hitting the plus button up top, insert, search for a container or vertical or whatever. And I'm going to click on vertical container once and then hit it one more time. Oh, but before you do it one second time, make sure that you have main container selected from the tree view. If you don't do that, let me make a mistake here. I'm going to screw this up here. I'm gonna hit. Uh, I'm gonna hit the um, uh, insert again and do container again. I'm gonna screw this up. Don't do what I'm doing. What I'm about to do here because it's gonna screw things up. I'll do vertical container again. Notice what's happened. Is it built a container within a container within a container? Now we're three levels into this dream. Big time inception. Now we don't. We didn't want that though. We wanted it to. We wanted to basically to have this container right here part of main container. So I'm gonna delete that. Okay, make sure I slip the main container and then I'll say insert um, and then I'll do vertical again and then select vertical container. Now we have what I'm looking for. See now you've got a plus button here, a plus button here. So now we truly have four zones in our application. Every so often, you're going to want to hit the save button up top right or hit control S if you want to save in a faster way. Every so often. All right, so I'm not gonna, I'm not, you could also publish it every so often also. So we have about five minutes left before our break. Let's do one or two more things inside of here. So one of the questions coming in from, from Howard, is it possible to directly use uh, data for, in a table from an external SQL server uh, to a form? Howard, great question. Dataver, or it's not Dataverse, but Canvas apps allow you to connect to almost 1,200 data sources. So not just SQL Server, but anywhere out there. So as you do this, the Dataverse has some advantages. We do not have to go to Dataverse to build this Canvas application, though. We could go right to SQL Server, right to SharePoint, right to Excel, and start building the data right there inside of that. So most certainly do that, Howard. Hopefully answered your question. If I did not, just re-ask it in a slightly different way there. All right, so let's build our header first before we go on break. So to do this, I'm gonna hit the plus button here, or I'm gonna click on the header and go to insert here. Either way, it does not matter. It does the same exact thing. Then I'm gonna go to modern, and you'll see a header option already here built for you. There's header right there. Make sure you're under modern when you do that. And when you go to modern, just hit the header button, and there's our header all lined up. Now this header lines up with um, the, the, uh, the theme that we currently have selected. Now, there's a few things you may want to do. You'll see right now I've got uh, you know, my, my logo in place, which we can change on the right side. You'll see the logo is right there. Simply upload your logo and you can add it there later. Don't worry about it right now. We can also see that it has SCR entry. Well, that's a terrible name for a screen. What we can do on the right side you'll see it was this title right there. Let's go ahead and select title, click on the word title on the right side while the header is selected. And then it's gonna show me in the property dropdown box that you selected title. I'm gonna remove this code that you see right here. This code essentially is showing 
that's going to show the current screen name, which is SCR entry. Instead, in double quotes, I'll put uh, time card entry screen or something like that. And double quotes. Once you do that, it reflects that inside the application. Well, I don't want to have this blue color. I want to have a different color. One of the ways we can, we can do this, we can build themes on the left side under themes. Okay, that's nice and dandy and as we do this. But what about my own theme? What if I wanted to create a Brian theme? That feature is not available yet. However, if you want to build your own kind of logic like that, I'm going to go to uh, this little option right here, the tree view option, click on the word app, and then I'm going to select from the drop down box formulas. Formulas are like Excel formulas, they allow you to, to, to write code, build it one time, and then bring it over, over and over and over again into your system. So hopefully Ace can go ahead and copy and paste this, this least two lines of code into the chat window, but I'm going to type these out in my case. I'm going to build a formula called con primary. Con primary is going to be equal to the color that I want as my primary color. I'll make that primary color color value because I'm going to basically do a, um, um, I'm going to go ahead and um, have a hex code of my color. Inside of a parenthesis now and inside of double quotes, I'm going to do hashtag or pound sign 0AA9FF. All right, let me zoom in so you guys can see that. Double quotes, close a parenthesis, and put a semicolon at the end. What this is doing is creating a formula that whenever I say CON primary, it's going to run that code right here, you see, called color value. And as I hover over this, we can see that color value is going to give us a color that is equal to that hex code right there. You can also put whatever code that you wish in there, whatever color you wish in there. In my case, though, let me do one more for my secondary color. This one will be called uh, CON uh, accent secondary or whatever, and that's going to be equal to a color value as well. All right, you can also use RGBA as well, but we'll, we'll start with this one for the time being. Hex code, all right, this one's an easy one, 676767. Oh, I did not type it easy, but I missed it up somehow. 676767, and then double quotes, and then close that parenthesis. Make sure you end with a semicolon formulas. Again, what this has done is it's made it to where anytime I refer to one of these words, it will run this code for me. We'll come back and play with that a little bit later too, and we'll use it, but it makes it where you don't have to write that code over and over and over again. Lastly, select your header, and you'll notice on the right side, it says base palette color. If I click on that word, you'll see it also in your property dropdown box. Now I can type in C-O-N primary. Oh, is it going to happen? And there it goes. So it's worked now to basically show it's putting a darker version of this color right here. But if I want to lighten that up, I can make it neutral or I can make it uh, lighter or whatever. But it's taking a gradient of that color that you see right here, and it's making the darker version because it's a header color. But if I were to change that then to C-O-N accent, We'll get the gray color instead of the blue color. So this is a way of building it one time and then referring to it over and over and over again. So these are called formulas. Now we are ready for our break time. Make sure you save now. We're gonna do a 10 minute break. I'll put a, a, a 10 minute clock on my screen. Look like this here in a moment. But a few things to note, Marshall, can I bring you on camera here again? All right. So, uh, yes, sir, bring me on. Hey, oh, there we go. I hear you. I don't see you though. Um, there we go. Can we bring you on camera and let's uh, let's take a look at this. Let's go ahead and draw our first contestant for the day. So, hey, there All we right. go. Oh, All right, that's, that's yep. been a better image there. Is that, that oh, my camera not working, I guess, huh? Actually, uh, you know, Brian, I think you wore out your camera. Uh oh, so, okay, uh, we're gonna, no worries, yep. no worries. We'll get that, we'll get that working during that break here. So, Marshall, yeah. Uh, we'll just do ventriloquist and you can go ahead and uh, I'll talk through you now. It's so, sock puppet. There we go. Let's go ahead and uh, draw our first drawing. This will be for a, our on-demand learning. We'll show what that looks like in a moment here after we get back from break. 
We're going to take people from the chat window that have already uh, submitted a question or a comment or anything in there. Just just uh, talk to the people. Go ahead, Marshall. Let's go and draw our first winner. And All right, here we go. Ahead. Good luck, everyone. Oh, here we go. And the answer is... Oh, what? Let's do it again. <laughs> That's us. <laughs> we won. We saw our right. top six. <laughs> That's a new one. I guess we did have the most Let's comments. Let's do one more time here. Let's do it one more time. <laughs> that means Ace has been busy. Uh, there and... are. And. Hey, oh, M Hatch. M Hatch. M Hatch. Mr. Mr. M -Hatch. The yes. There we uh, go. How, how would M Hatch uh, claim their prize? Absolutely. Uh, please send an email to marketing at pragmaticworks.com. And uh, we will get you set up with a free uh, annual subscription to our on-demand learning uh, program. All so, right. Please sweet. go ahead and do that. And um, real quick, speaking of that, uh, Brian, if you don't mind, I'd like to remind everybody that we do have a special right now on our uh, on-demand learning uh, for the next uh, through Saturday or Sunday, actually. Uh, you can save 50% on an annual subscription if you use the code CERTXPLAUNCH. So be sure to go to our website, uh, use that code, and sign up for your own annual subscription to on-demand learning. Excellent. All right. So uh, let's take a 10-minute break. Right now, it's around 12.32 East Coast time. I'll put 10 on the clock. Uh, I think Marshall has a video maybe he wants to show, but I'll go ahead and start that timer now. I will see you in 10 minutes. Stretch your legs, get some coffee, and when we come back, we will see you then. Take care, guys. Hello, project managers, and I'm here to invite you to sign up for our next month Learn of the Nerd session on Microsoft Project. We are going to walk you how to create your own timeline, how you can start your project from zero, including all the tracking capabilities, variances, baselines, and so on, costs, very important. And we're also going to show you a complete project and how you can track the progress of that project. And we're going to have a Q&A session, so hopefully we'll be able to answer all the questions you might have. If you're interested, make sure you sign up, and I'll see you there soon. Uh, enjoyed your small little break there. Uh, a few things that we got asked uh, uh, during the during break also. One of the big things we got asked is, is the calendar that we sent out was for an hour and a half. Our apologies. You guys get bonus time. So you get not just time uh, with me for an hour and a half. Uh, again, this is all being recorded. So if you can't make the hour and a half, the last hour and a half, where we actually get uh, into the Canvas app side and have some other fun stuff, then, then you can always watch the recording. You're just going to miss out on the fun raffle we do at the end of the time also. Speaking of the raffle, we mentioned before, we, we um, um, as we had this open a moment ago, this is what uh, Hatch just won. So we have a on our on-demand site, you'll find us at pragmaticworks.com. When you go to pragmaticworks.com, you'll see in the top right, it says start learning. Once you're there, uh, there are about oh, hundreds of classes out here. You'll see just, just tons and tons of content around Power Apps, Power BI, and all those kind of things. Why are we giving the sale this month? So we just launched this, this, this option here called Cert XP. It's where you're trying to uh, learn how to uh, get certified, right? Not, not a pragmatic work certification, a Microsoft certification or a CompTIA one or those ones. We have a lot more coming out with this. We're starting on our beta launch with these three, and we have two more we're launching next week, two more behind that, and so on and so on. So I'm going to try the PL200, which is one of the, uh, the Microsoft ones. We wanted to find a way to gamify it to where you felt like it wasn't a chore to get ready for a certification. So as I go through this, you can see I started down here. I failed a few, passed a few. And as I go through this, if I, if I hit that little continue button, we'll see a few things. First of all, I, I have ADD. I'm, I'm just going to tell you straight up. I am, um, I'm, I'm, I have some challenges around like reading long questions. This is a relatively short question, but if I were to go and hit the you can hear it actually reads the question to you. How many data sources we can say, hey, it's over a thousand data sources. This goes to a question actually right now from uh, Sri. Sri's asking a question, could you import an Excel spreadsheet form at, or an, an access form? Well, the good thing about Dataverse is because the way Dataverse operates, uh, you can import data very easily using things like data flows or even copy and paste um, you, if, if you want to import Dataverse. If you want to use uh, Excel or Access directly in an application, I would recommend not doing that. Excel is not a database, and it will go a little bit, a little bit crazy if you try to treat it like one. Access, unfortunately, is not covered by that. 
but this is related to your question you saw a moment ago. So when I hit submit, it will tell me I got the answer right, and it lets, lets you know why I got the answer right also. So I can see here that the answer is good and keep on going the next one, and you can hear there we go. So I'm going through. I'm going to get this one wrong on purpose this time and hit continue. But see this question here? This is a typical question for, for uh, a certification, right? Long, long question. It makes your eyes cross. You get you guys get tired of looking at it. So this is the way you can kind of look at that and 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 audit and find find this. The next question here for my favorite uh, 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 name of the day here is from Spider Poop Poop. All right, my four year old is just giggling. My four year old uh, myself is just giggling right now. I want to hear that. So let me stop her right now. Sorry about that. So uh, for the question from from Spider Poop Pop. Uh, is, um, uh, in this case, do you have to install a client agent in order to connect to SQL Server on-prem? Yes, to do that, if you want to use Dataverse or want to use SQL Server to connect to that, you would use something like the, oh, not, uh, not, you would use the on-prem data gateway. You download it for free, you install it on one server, and unless you access that on-prem server from the cloud at that point. This is the same gateway that's used for Power BI and for Azure and Power Automate also. So absolutely, you'll find it right over here under more, and you'll see um, as you look at that, you'll be able to download that that inside of the connected connections, and if you hit discover all to find it there. Okay. Also, when you create a connection, I get a question a lot about these slides. Question connection connectivity questions. Look at all the data sources we have here, and one is SQL Server. To answer your question, Spider, uh, when I select SQL Server, it's going to ask me first thing as I scroll down. Hey, uh, how do you want to connect to it? and I'll pick SQL Server. In the very bottom, there's a gateway. That's how you basically connect to an on-prem data source. So yes, you can. Just note it will be a little slower to connect to those sometimes also as you do that. So again, the, the uh, CERT XP, uh, we have it as, as half off this month. Marshall, when you show the code one more time, uh, this, will, this, this discount code that you're seeing right below me will give you, uh, will give you the 50% discount for the next, I think it's the next uh, little bit here. Uh, there we go. Uh, so it's about to expire, so make sure you do it quickly. And this will give you uh, all of our on-demand classes, CERT XP, all that stuff in one foul swoop here for you. Okay, great questions. All right, let's begin again. So back when I was starting again, let me go over here again and open up the application I left off of. When we left off, we had got the skeleton of the application done. We had the Maldron app done. And we also have um, the, the zones kind of all ready to go here as well. Now, our next step, speaking of the SQL Server questions we're getting asked, on the left side, you'll see that database icon on the left. If you were to select that database icon on the left and hit Add Data, we can go through and add the tables that we wish. Notice data, Dataverse, though, is showing right up top here. So I can search for, in my case, projects. There it is, and click on projects. I can hit add data again and search for contacts. Click on it again, there's contacts. Then I can search for it again and look for time cards. There it is, click on it, and there's time cards. So I added the three data sources that you're seeing right here, boom, 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 and I can at any point right click on those and actually go right to the data if I wanted to. So if I want to add more projects, no problem. I can right click, hit edit data, and start adding more projects. Not important right now though. Additionally to my SQL Server people in the audience, you can search for SQL Server, there it is. And it gives you a little icon right here. This little premium button here means you do require a license of Power Apps to, to run this, not just an office license to run it, but a full Power Apps license. Okay, so my goal again is to refresh you. I'm gonna put my list of projects over here. On the right side, I'll have a form to enter data. Okay, and on the bottom here, I'll have my old, my old time cards down here. So those are the zones we're gonna work with. Let's start with this left sidebar right here. For this sidebar here, I'm gonna hit the plus button next to uh, the uh, inside this container. And I want to search for vertical gallery. So I'm going to search, not in the modern one, but in the classic one, you'll see vertical gallery right here. So again, my steps where I click on the plus button, I'll hit vertical gallery. Make sure you're in classic though before you do that. 
Sweet. Now, a few things to note here. As I do this, the first thing it's going to ask me is which table do I want to go to? Well, I want to go to my projects table, so I'm going to click on projects right there. I also, by the way, could have done this on the right side by selecting projects on the left side. Either way, there's about four ways of doing this to get the same thing. A third way is up top. The items property for the gallery is set to projects. It's all doing the same thing. Well, I don't have a picture for projects or a time for projects. All I care about is the name of the project. So while I have the gallery selected, like you see right now, or you can go to the tree view and make sure the gallery is selected this way. Once you do that, go to layout on the right side and change it from image, title, and subtitle to title instead. This little down arrow right there and just select title instead. Notice your gallery is called, so it's just simply gallery one right now. Now there's a little bug right now that we have that, uh, well, Microsoft has in this case, that whenever I select, selected that, notice the, the box is a little bit wider than it should be right now. That's not great, right? So if I select the container and I just hit the drop down box or property drop down box, what I'm looking for here is the width property. And you can see right now what they've done, the why the bug exists is for this gallery one. I'm going to go to width. And right now, this width that you're seeing here in red has been hard coded. OK, so this is hard coded right now. So we want to go ahead and change that to where if you're on a phone device, it, sk it skinnies itself down automatically. So I'm going to go ahead and change that 640 to parent dot width. By me typing in the P, it kind of gives me all the information. I'll click on parent dot width. It finishes it up. Parent dot width means, hey, this is my, this is my uh, gallery right here. Look to my parent, which is this container right here, and do its width. So parent dot width looks one level up and says, what is the width of this, of this object? So in other words, the parent dot width of, of this is going to be the width of the container right below it. The container's parent dot width is the width of the application above it. So everything has a parent until you get the top dog here. OK, if you have employees, pro, this is a question from Sabrina. If you have employee project and historic time card entries in SQL Server tables, but don't want to give all the employees premium licenses, what do you recommend? Well, that's a great question, Sabrina. In that case, what I'd recommend is using something like Power Pages to do that or using Dataverse for Teams. Or you could even use like Microsoft Forms, which then writes over to a premium data source. Uh, but you can have your cake and eat it too. Power Apps for Teams gives you the same kind of interfaces in a Teams environment that's included in your Office license today. And then Power Pages allows you to scale that license to people that are only actively using the application each month. Those are two options I'd probably select in, in, my, in my case. Okay. So again, uh, one, uh, if, if some people are saying that they, they, hey, I don't see uh, the classic modern options. Again, you'll find the description of this in the chat window, as well as the description of the video if you're watching this later as well. There's the step-by-step the -step instructions there. But if you go to settings, AV, scroll down on settings, what you're looking for is modern controls and themes. And that's, that, that's described also in the directions if you so chose also. Okay. So we have our first, first gallery of data here. This, these galleries allow you to see data very, very easily and, uh, and interact with the data, hitting arrows to do something. You can also do other stuff inside that as well. There's another way of seeing data as well, and that's called a data table. Uh, there's some quirks in it right now. That's why I'm not going to show that to you, but it, there's other ways of showing it other than a gallery. But galleries are probably the most interactive way of playing with your data. Now, I want to build a, 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 a form to enter the data next and also a gallery down here to see the data. So how about we start with the gallery next? So this, this area that you're seeing down below, I'm going to put a list of all my old time cards into here. So if I hit the plus button again, I'm going to click on vertical gallery again under classic. Okay. This time, I'm going to point to time cards. So select time cards as it pops out here. 
If you don't get the pop out, you can also select time cards up here in your data source. Okay, there we go. Now there's a lot more we're gonna do on this, this time card right here. It looks pretty darn ugly right now, right? I've got a time card, but we're gonna come back to it a little bit later. But I just wanna show you right now that we see the data as it is. There's a few more things we wanna do. We wanna filter this to where you only see the time card so whatever you select on the left, we want it to filter on the right. So as you pick a different project, filter that down. That'll be our next set. And we also want to sort the data. So I wanna filter it and sort it by my most recent time cards up top. So we'll start there and then our final step, at, we'll do our form next. And then we're gonna lastly uh, pretty up our form, pretty up uh, the gallery. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we're going to keep it pretty darn ugly right now. So you see, this is, this is the ugly version of it right there. But we're going to add some more data, and then we're going to pretty it up after we have our form in place. Let's start with a filter, though. Let's filter it and sort it. I'm going to select my entire gallery. Now, a few things to note. Make sure you have the whole gallery selected, not just your first row. The first row is your template. And I'll show you an example of that later. So make sure you pick the whole gallery. You can check to make sure by looking in the right here on the left here, mine is called gallery two and gallery one. For the, I would normally rename all these objects like GAL projects, GAL time cards. I would not put spaces in it either. But for the time being, just go ahead and if, if yours are not called gallery one and gallery two, go ahead and call it gallery one and gallery two. So yours matches my name until we finish up. Okay. So with gallery two now selected, you'll notice the data is coming from time cards. Notice in my case also, I can hit the down arrow next to it and I can see the row of data that, that I have in that table right now. If I go through again though, and I put the command of how I want to go through and filter this data. Well, they try to make this a low code environment. So in one line of code, we're gonna filter it and sort it. Let's start with a filter command. The filter command is going to filter this time card table based on whatever's on the left. So I'm going to type in project. I want to, I want to go ahead and say filter it based on the project's ID. So I'll say project dot project. Now it sounds a little goofy there, right? Project dot project. It's referring to the. Uh, oh, sorry. There we go. Okay inside the time card table you saw right there so inside the time card table there's a column called project and in that in that table there's another column called project remember that if the table name and the column name match that is your primary key that's what makes a record unique across all those values so this right here actually is kind of answering pavel's question right Pavel's question is, hey, is there a way to create a unique record ID for every project that is that is uh, in the link? Yes, that is this project ID that I'm using right now, this project. So notice if I were to look at this uh, table right here, don't do this, and I add that project column. There it is. See, table name, column name matches. There is my GUID right there. Okay, so when I say, um, when, I, when I'm pointing over here to project table, it, so what, it, what it's doing here is saying, okay, in the time card table, there's a column called project. That links to the other table called project. And then when I hit dot, here are all the columns from that table. It's basically joining the two tables together for me automatically. So if I say project dot project, it now knows to go get the ID from that project. Now I want that to be equal to whatever you selected on the left side. That was called gallery one, I believe, right? There it is, gallery one dot selected dot project and close the parenthesis. So again, my data disappeared because now none of these, these projects have anything associated with them except for my dynamics rollout. So what this is doing is saying, all right, take the GUID for Dynamics Rollout, pass it in to, uh, right here, 
and then match it up against whatever is on the time card and only show me the time cards that have that project on it. I can now click on the word filter and look what actually happens. It actually showed me the one record. If I select a different project, click on the word filter, all my data goes away now because it just can't find any records there. So you can use this down arrow to kind of test out your code prior to actually working on it. You can also select certain things like this gallery dot selected right here. And you can see there's a GUID being passed in right there. That is the project ID being passed in back to uh, uh, Pavel's question. I know a lot of folks are from India right now. That is crazy late your time. Thank you so much for joining us. It is crazy uh, that you guys are up at what, two in the morning or, or really late in the morning right now. I'm impressed. You guys have some stamina right now. Those are hardcore people. Uh, awesome. All right, now if I wanna sort the data, I can also put the word sort in front of filter. And at the very end, I'll do a comma. And what do I wanna sort by? I wanna sort by the bill date. So whatever date you put in to put the newest time cards up top, I'll do a comma again. And I'm gonna, it's gonna tell me, hey, sort descending. Again, this exact code is in the, um, the uh, Word doc as well. But as you can see here, what it's basically doing is, it, is it's, it's, it's stacking the formula here. It's saying filter the data, take whatever's been filtered, and now sort the data. You can click on any word and it will show you down below what the repercussions of that was. So I take the raw table, filter it. Take that filter table, sort it. And all you have to do is say sort this table by whatever column, and then ascending or descending. So question here from the gist here, is there, a, is there uh, sorry, if there are any duplicate projects in the table with each row showing the project status, would, uh, would the gallery show multiple instances? It would absolutely do that uh, gist. So in this case, when this case, what I'm doing is I'm showing it based on product on project names. So I may want to put some extra identifiers underneath it, like the start date, end date of the project, or maybe some other project ID on it or something that makes that project a little more unique. But yes, if I had two project twos, I would see two project twos here also, unless I group the data somehow. Great question. All right, so we have our data now filtered. We have our data now so sorted. Now we're ready to build a way to enter new, uh, new projects in here, our new time cards in here. So I'm gonna hit this little plus button that you see right here. Now this plus button right here is gonna allow us to add, we're gonna add an edit form inside there. Let's go ahead and select that. I'll type in edit form. All right, beautiful. Now let someone know where do you want to go with this data? On the right side, you see where it says data source. I'm gonna hit the down arrow there and select time cards again. Now what's gonna happen is it's gonna automatically look at these columns and say, all right, here are the columns I think you need. What it doesn't do is add lookup columns. And I don't want them to add things like time card numbers and those kind of things. So let's go ahead and figure out how we can add more columns. On the right side, again, I, I, I added the form right here. Select that white area to make sure the whole form is selected. You see it right there, my whole form is selected. Then we're gonna to go to fields on the right side and we'll hit for selected. This is going to allow us to go ahead and see all the fields that are involved in this. For example, I don't really think people need to or care about the, uh, the time card number. So I can hit the three dot next to it. There we go. And I can remove that field. I think they're gonna care though, uh, and they should not see the approval date. They should not be able to approve their own. I'm gonna hit the three dot next to it and I'm gonna remove that one. Oh, let me go try that again. Hit the three dot next to it. There it goes. Why is it hiding from me right now? Oh, they all hit for me. Let me try that again. All right, my three dot disappeared. Let me try going back to it again. There it is, three dot and remove. My zooming must have messed up there. All right, so uh, I'm gonna hit add field and add the other two fields I care about. I care about the employee that did the time card, the description they did on that time card. And as I scroll down, I care about the project on the time card. So I'm gonna hit the add button on those two. So again, I added, I'm gonna go ahead and, and collapse all these so you can see them a little better here. These are the, these are the fields that I added here. 
uh, I removed the other two and I added these guys right here. These are all, these are two of these are lookup columns. And you'll notice that if I go to description, we can change like what kind of data type it is. So am I, am I, edit, well, is this view only? Is it edit? And I don't want rich text editors. All those things can be modified right there. But I'm going to leave them pretty much as is. Once I'm done, and of course, we can also, by the way, shuffle these around and drag and drop them. So for some reason, it's not letting me do it again. So I'll go back to this again. And now I can drag and drop it. And as I move these fields around, it will move them around there as well. Go ahead and move project first and then employee next. It's a reason why I'm having you do that. And we'll keep description last. Okay, so it should look something like this. The order ultimately does not matter. That looks really crowded to me. So you'll see how kind of crowded it looks. On the right side, there's an option over here to change how many columns are being shown. So I'll make mine two columns. Oh, that looks a lot better. But now I've got too much stuff in here now, right? Too much space is being occupied. So wouldn't it be great instead to default some of these values to, their, to the proper data source? So I want to go ahead and have today's date here, okay? I'm going to put uh, my employee here, information here, and I'm going to default this to whatever project was selected. Those are my th three things I'm going to go ahead and do next. Let's start with build date. We're going to rinse and repeat this over and over and over again. So build date. If I select the build date card, notice this is the field and this is the card that goes around it. So when you hear me refer to a card, that's my, that's my, uh, this is a control inside there, a little mini control. And this card is like a mini screen. It has all these things, but I cannot drag anything inside of here, cannot be dragged outside of here. This is like a mini screen and it's isolated to itself. If you want to play with this stuff though, you right click on the card and you say unlock. This lets you now uh, drive what's inside that card. For the date here, if you select the little date picker, and I'm gonna change what you're seeing up top. So first step, select the date picker there. Then change it up top to the word um, now, open, close, parenthesis. Let me zoom out here. Again, step one. Step one is you unlock the field. You're gonna do this over and over again, so I'm gonna document really well here. Step two, select your date picker. Okay. Step three, make sure the default date is selected there. And then lastly, step four, type in now open close parenthesis to set that equal to today's date. You can also go through though, uh, there's, there's a today function which only shows you the day's date. That's what I typically would use here. Now we'll show you the date and the time. But in my case, it's stripping the time off. All right, common question, can I hide this now? It's really based on your requirements, right? I could select that whole thing and say visible, not visible. It's up to you. In my case, I do want my consultants to be able to go ahead and put a time card in for a previous date. So I'm going to leave that uh, here as well. Another good question we got from Gary is, hey, can I, now that I have a, an employee's name in here, can I filter it to where they can only see their own time cards? Gary, absolutely, yes, you can. And we'll show you uh, some ways of doing that a little bit later here also. So we're gonna, we're, that's our next step in the, in the, in out of the gate here is we're gonna show uh, how to do that and how do you lock those down also. All right, great questions, guys, and they keep them coming. We are already, poor Ace uh, had 830 questions so far. She is, they are killing it in the background right now. Uh, and thank you, Ace, for doing that. All right, so now our next step is I may want to go through and put whatever project was selected over here and put it into the, this area on the right here. I'm gonna do the same thing again. I'm gonna right click, unlock for project. Select that project drop down box, and then on items, change this to default selected items. Make sure you use default selected items and not just default. Okay? After you do that, your next step is you wanna go through and set that to whatever project was selected on the left side. Do you remember how to do that now that you've seen that a few times? Well, I'll give you a few seconds to think about that and pause me if you want to. I'm going to change it to gallery one, which is where you selected that item, dot select it. 
take whatever record was selected on the left side. Project four. Oh, let me go ahead. I'm holding the Alt key down to select different projects here. And as I select different ones, my drop down box is also changing. So in my case, I'm going to make it to where when I select this, there's no point in showing this project anymore. So I'm going to select the project card right here. And then I'm going to go over here and make the visible property to false. So that way it disappears, creating a little bit more wiggle room for me. Awesome. The other thing I may want to do is, is set the default, the uh, employee here as well. So let's do that one next. All right. So step one for that. I'm going to go ahead and do some a really a nifty thing here. I'm hoping I, I don't want to write this code over and over again on how to look up your information. Uh, Gary asked a question earlier. This Gary I asked a question earlier about how can I default this to only my own records. Well, we can we can see that in a moment here. But the first step on how I can find out what record Gary is in the contact table. So hopefully you've added your name in that contact table. To find that name. I'm going to go over to my tree view and then go to app where I have my formula that you see right here. I'm going to increase the size of this just a little bit here. And I'm going to type in, how about a con user? I'll do equals. And this formula is going to look up your email based on your email address, your contact record. So I'm going to say look up. Look up is how you can do it. Look up, you'll pass some information in just like filter and it will return a single record back. So look up against the contacts table. There it is, oh, contacts table. And then from the contacts table, I want to find out your email address. So there's a, there's a column called email inside the contacts table. I want that to be equal to user open close parenthesis dot email. Now, for those that is the first time seeing this, we do have a cheat sheet on our website. Go to uh, pragmaticworks.com, go to resources, and you'll find the cheat sheets right there. What this is showing us, though, there we go. I'll zoom in so you guys can see. We have a little bit different resolution here. Look up. It's going to look up a record. Contacts table. So this is my table that I want to look up against. All right. Oh, there we go. Table. Uh, this uh, right here is going to be the column that I want to match up against. So in that contacts table, there's a column called, oops, sorry, I should say a column. In that contacts table, there's a, co a column called email. This user open close parenthesis dot email is always going to pull in the logged in user email address. So that actually will pull their email address, their photo, or their full name. So that's, that's how you can kind of deconstruct this. This is documented though in the documentation on this, uh, in this uh, pinned comments, or you can also go to our cheat sheet on our website. Again, if in case you're curious, you'll find that at pragmaticworks.com under resources and cheat sheets. And if I go to pra uh, power apps, there is our cheat sheet and you'll see all a whole bunch of helpful links and there is a user function right there. So it kind of helps you go through all that mess. All right. Make sure you save on a very periodic basis here. Hit the control S to save every so often. All right, so question here from Jackie. Hey, can I add a new project on the left side? We can most certainly add things like a little plus button here that adds a new project. Or what we can do is we can go over here. If you want to be lazy, Jackie, you can go to the model driven app and do it over here. Uh, or if you want to be lazier, hit the database icon Go to projects, right click on it and say edit data. And now you can add another project here just by you know, typing like you do in Excel here. Hit project six. And when I close it, watch what happens. All right, in a few seconds, it should refresh. And I now have project six. You can't see it because I, I need to scroll down here, but there's project six right there. I need to make this higher, a, uh, um, a taller gallery, but that's how you can do it. Jackie, about three different ways of doing that here. Um, Ace, would you mind unhiding that? Uh, oh, here we go. I can just do it here. Uh, oh, there we go. Thank you so much, Ace. All right. So with that now done, we have to get the employee information inside of here, just like we do with a project. I'm going to right click and unlock it. Then I'm going to select the employee and just like last time, default selected items from the drop down box, the property drop down box. Default selected items. 
take parent.default and type in con and there's my con user right there oh nelly there's brian right there nice all right i'm pound it nice all right so i'm gonna go ahead and select this card and i'm gonna hide it as well now look how things are all starting to fit together now right i have all the data in one one tidy little interface and there are some challenges still but we're getting there now right the project defaults the employee defaults the time defaults so now i as a consultant all i have to do is put the number of hours i've worked in the description done now there's one more little gotcha here for those that have been curious and they may have hit the play button you may have noticed no item to display all right i'm gonna hit the escape to get out of that so what that means when you see no item to display is this form right now is an edit mode and it's trying to figure out what row do you want to edit this same form can edit data and it can insert data so it's important when if you, if you want to insert new time cards the form must be in new mode right now this form is an edit mode was asking well what in the heck do you want to edit right now you haven't told me what to edit so what you need to do is select your entire form and on the right side you'll see default mode right there change that to new mode click on the click on the form and change its mode to new after you do that and you hit the play button hey that is the most common error you're going to see so again i'm going to show it one more time because this is a really important one when you build a power app and you see this that is why you're seeing this the form is in edit mode and you have not told it what row to edit so it's important when you're building a form that you want to insert data that that form has to be a new mode by changing the default mode to new then the form will come up beautifully at that point okay the number one gotcha we see in our classes that we have okay now what are we missing here huh oh, you know what i'm missing a button to actually save this data so what i'm going to do is i'm going to go ahead and select this tree view make sure that i have container one selected in the tree view or whatever you call that container that's up top then i'm going to say insert and button boop there we go it's going to put the button in the top in the bottom left corner and the reason why it did it is because it's trying to be responsive it's trying to make sure that if you um, are on a cell phone that this button still works if you do not want that you can actually use a different type of container that does allow you to move it around notice by default though if i were to go up top and say insert button it just don't do this it will just kind of put it free floating wherever and i can drag it wherever i want um, if you do that just a note that that button will still work even though that button's not near the form not in the container not in the form it will still work so let's select that button of course one of the things i want to do is i'm going to change that word button to save on the right side i also want to change its color so maybe what i do is for this button i'm going to look for um, its fill color here there it is from the property drop down box and I'm going to change its color from this RGBA color to CON accent, if you want. All right, give a little bit of a variation in our, our app now. So now we have the gray color buttons and the blue color header. Awesome. Okay, so for the save button, do you believe that in about 30 seconds, we're going to be able to save data to this now? So select that save button and look for the property called on success. And we're doing great on time. I think we're actually going to have time to show you one more type of app, Power Pages, at the end here. Oh, three apps in three hours. How about a mind, mind mess up there, right? All right, so we'll select that Save button and where the false is there. I'm going to add two words that are going to make it where I can save the data on this form. All right, before I do that, notice this form right now is called Form 1. So just kind of glance down and make sure your form is called something similar. Then I'll select this where it says on select. I'll type submit form. 
I type you type it, I type you type in SU, you should see this that you can click on and it will fill this in for you. Submit form is those two words to do that. Open parenthesis, what form do you want to submit? Form one, and then close the parenthesis. Now we are done, but don't hit submit yet. All right, what this is showing us is those two words there, submit form, your form name, is going to send the data to the database. If the form is in edit mode, it sends an update to the database. If the form is in new mode, it sends an insert to the database. Now that is done agnostic of your data source. So if you are using SQL Server, it will send it to SQL Server. If you're using SharePoint, it goes to SharePoint. Excel goes to Excel. It does not matter. So this, what, it, what happens, it translates these two words into how, how do I do this against SQL Server? Oh, you want to do insert into table name, yada, yada, yada. It actually turns that into a native query against that. So all the code we've done today, it does not matter what our data source is. What you've learned today works across every type of data source out there. Okay, that's a cool thing about this. One language serves them all. All right, so I've got my submit form done. But what if a failure happens? What if I have a blank or I point to a project that's been deleted or whatever? You know, my insert fails. How do I fix that? Well, one thing I would recommend is selecting the entire form again to make sure form one is selected. And in the drop down box here, the property drop down box, look for on success. And for this, you'll see faults right now, meaning nothing happens right now if the record actually makes the database. There's also on error, by the way, as well. So if a record successfully makes it to the database, what do you want to do? Well, I want to notify them that they've done something really cool. I'm going to notify them and in double quotes, I'll say, bravo, you know, uh, time card saved, whatever. You can also append in other stuff like for project ABC. You can do all that in here with an ampersand. We'll show that a little later. Then I'll do a comma. Is it an error message, a warning, a success? This is a success, so I'll go ahead and select that. Then I'll hit a comma again. And how long do you want this message to show up? I want it to show up for two, for, for two seconds, so I'll just do 2,000. That's how many milliseconds do you want it to show up? So what this is saying, I'm gonna show this message as a green bar across the thing, because it's a success. And it's going to show for two seconds. Awesome. Then you can do a, a semicolon. The semicolon is going to say, do this, now this. Then we'll go ahead and say, hey, I want to reset this form back to new mode. What happens whenever I submit a, day, a record, it is going to go back to edit mode, even though I told it to go to new mode. So we'll say new form, form one. This is going to programmatically do what you did over here. When you set the default mode, this code right here is going to programmatically do that for you. Otherwise, it will flip to edit mode and give you the same error message you saw before. Okay. Now we're done with, with the form at least. Save that application, play that application, and try that application. Pick a project that works for you. I'll use my, dyna my, uh, my Dynamics rollout. I'm gonna bill four hours or five hours for a boring meeting. Boring me meeting, that'd be worse. All right, I'll save that. When I do that, watch what happens. Green bar, it resets, ready for my next new record. All right, I also did three hours today uh, for a ritualistic meeting. All right, and put whatever I want there, hit save, boom. Three records, three time cards saved. I can also go and set other projects now and go do those and set those three hours for this one. Hit save, project five has three hours. My, my Dynamics rollout has this one. This one has, you know, approved lease. You know, those kind of things are all done. Two hours for that. So all this is built on today. So I have one view, one view that says by project, what happened today? Awesome. And then we can build some Power BI reports onto it. Now check this out. As I've been doing this over in my other application, under time cards, ooh, there are my three time cards right there. And then one of those time cards, which I think was on this one right here, uh, as you can see, 
The description's all in there. Uh, there it is. The ritualistic beating is right there. All set. Dynamics projects are hard. It occasionally takes a ritualistic beating to get that project over the finish line. All right. So now that we have that, we've done our form. Now we want to clean up that, uh, that gallery you're seeing down below. This means nothing to me, right? So how do I make that gallery a little, a little prettier now? Well, let's start right here right, where we see, uh, let me go ahead and get out of this now. And let's talk about a few rules of this before we go. All right, first rule of Gallery Club. The first rule of Gallery Club is nobody talks about Gallery Club because nobody cares about Gallery Club. But the second rule of Gallery Club is your first row right here. If you select your first row, that is your template. So as you move stuff around, every row underneath it also moves. The, sec the third rule of Gallery Club is your second, third, fourth rows select the entire gallery. So if you want to change a row, only select the first row to do that. Okay. Oh, I think our camera just died there also. All right. All right. So, uh, so while we're doing this, all right, Justin, would you mind coming over? There we go. All right. So it, the camera keeps on timing out there on us. Sorry, folks. Uh, actually, it's probably a better Alrighty guys, don't worry if you can't hear Brian, we're going to get that fixed in just a second here.